Uh, a number of questions have come in during the week or over the, even over the last couple of weeks that we haven't gotten to on the show, and I thought I'd start out with those. And the first question especially <clears throat> I think is a very, very valuable question to uh, pinpoint some uh, important points, and that is a question that I got uh, out in cyberspace, and I have to admit that somehow or other with all the questions I brought with me to Atlanta, this one particular one got lost, but I remember the question quite well, but I can't tell you who sent it in. Uh, the question was, there is a site that uh, points out all the weaknesses in libertarianism, all the, the problems with libertarianism, and one of the things that they show on that site is various, what I would call, lifeboat situations. In other words, situations that seem to have no possible uh, remedy to them whatsoever, no possible good answer. And the expression lifeboat situation comes from the idea that if you and I are in a lifeboat someplace and you decide to drill a hole in your end of the lifeboat, do I have the right to try to stop you? Do I have the right to use force, aggression, to try to stop you from drilling a hole in your end? That's the lifeboat situation. And the particular example that is given is uh, plane crashes. And there are, it's out in the desert, and there are five people who survive the plane crash, but they are having trouble surviving in the desert. And they keep walking and walking, and they are just about out of, uh, what is it, nutrients. They, they're about to die if they don't get water. And they arrive at a house, and there's a man there, and he refuses to give them water or food or anything else. And these five people are going to die if they don't get water and food. Do they have the right? in a libertarian world, to take the water and food from the man. Is he guilty of murder if he doesn't give it to them? Uh, are they guilty of aggression if they take it from him? And what would happen in a libertarian world? But what would happen in any world? In any world, it would be a difficult situation and a difficult choice for the people to make. What we have here is not the question of political organization of society, uh, of, of having a, a libertarian world in which libertarian rules uh, of interaction among individuals are enforced in some way, somehow. But rather, what we have is a case of individual libertarianism, of what an individual will do to live his life. And that's a different story altogether. And as far as I'm concerned, I know that if I steal something from someone, there are going to be consequences to me. And I have to recognize that if I'm one of those five people and I decide to wrench the food and water from the man who refuses to give it to me. Now, I can say afterward, I had to do that, or I would have died. But anybody who knows me then would have to wonder whether in the future I was in a situation of really life and death and might take something from that person. Uh, that's an individual decision that I have to make as part of my moral code of conduct, my way of living. It has nothing to do with how to organize society. Now, there are various answers to the question as there are various answers to many moral questions, but they all involve individual conduct, individual codes of conduct, rather than interaction among individuals and how they are expected to act uh, among each other in a libertarian society, uh, how they're supposed to act towards each other. And we need to understand that. We need to understand that there are two entirely separate things. I wrote a book called How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. Way back, it came out in 1973, 32 years ago. And I hope that uh, it will come out again. It was republished in 97 after... Uh, going out of print, and then it fell out of print again, and it will, I hope, be published again sometime in the next year. And the whole point of the book was to lay out a, a an individual libertarian code of conduct. Not the code of conduct, but a code of conduct that could inspire individuals to develop a code of conduct of their own. And that was an individual libertarian approach to the matter. There was very, very little in there about... Uh, societal approach to libertarianism, although the principles were the same and you would be bound to notice the similarity if you read the book. But my point is this, that we can, can confuse things in this way and we shouldn't confuse things in this way. We shouldn't take lifeboat situations and try to apply them to uh, society and say that uh, here's the iron fast rule and so forth, when what we're really talking about is individual decisions and how an individual would react. Well, I also got a question from Eric. Uh, oh, incidentally, if you have any comments about that and uh, anything that you think uh, would cast some light on that, I hope you'll call in and let me know because it is an important and an interesting aspect of the libertarian world and the libertarian thinking. Eric, in uh, Southern California, I'm sure, uh, wrote to say in Los Angeles this past week, we had many wildfires. The government is patting itself on the back for all the brush clearance laws that 
were obeyed this time around, which resulted in only a few houses burning down. How would a libertarian world handle brush clearance laws like those that we have now? If my neighbor does not clear his brush and it catches fire and the embers fly into my barn and cause a fire, would I be able to sue for damages? What if my neighbor's home is also destroyed and he has no resources left to pay me for the damage? Would a libertarian world use insurance companies to require fireproofing? Would there be CCs and R's, builder contracts, with buyers? Well, what would you see as the solution here? Well, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, the fire season isn't over yet, and we'll just have to see what happens. But secondly, the question of how would a libertarian world handle brush clearance laws. Let's suppose that there were no brush clearance laws whatsoever. Well, what would happen is a few houses would burn down as a result of that, and people would stop buying houses in the, the fire areas. And people who wanted to sell property in the fire uh, areas would have a hard time selling those homes. So they would have to hire somebody who's got the brains to figure out a way to make absolutely sure that nobody is vulnerable to his neighbor's foliage. And the nice thing about the free market is you don't have to know the answer to everything. When Y2K came back in 2000, I didn't know how it was going to be solved. I could think of a few ways that it might be solved, and I saw a few ways by which it was already being solved. But there were other ways being developed all the time. And... I didn't know what those ways were. I didn't know how they worked. I didn't know how to program the computer to make sure that everything was taken care of in time and so forth. I could imagine some ways from the little programming I've had in the past, but that just was because I happened to have had some programming experience. But the point is that uh, we don't have to know all these things because there are other people who want to make money and who do know how to do these things. Somebody's going to figure out how we're going to make sure that I can buy a house and not be vulnerable to my neighbor's brush that my neighbor can't, by his, uh, what is the word, uh, laxity, uh, cause my house to burn down. And there may be some kind of restrictive covenant laws. As you say, it may be the insurance companies will make absolutely sure that uh, nobody has a, uh, that, that kind of situation. They might come in and inspect before they would even issue any fire insurance. And as uh, Eric says, um, would they regulate fireproofing? Yes, probably in some way. As it is, my insurance company asked me all sorts of questions when I wanted to, to get the insurance on the house that I live in. They wanted to know where the nearest fire uh, hydrant was. They wanted to know a whole lot of things, and they determined the rate as a result of that. And all of these things come into play, and the, the again, I hate to keep using the expression, but the point is that somebody is going to make sure that this doesn't happen because somebody will have a profit-seeking interest in making sure that it doesn't happen. And that's the beauty of the free market. That is not the beauty of government regulation, because government regulation has political motivations rather than profit motivations. And political motivations are vastly different. Political motivations uh, will reward the asbestos manufacturers. Political motivations will reward a lot of people who contribute money to the party. Political motivations will reward a lot of people who have political pull in Washington. Uh, political motivations will not be aimed in the same direction as profit-seeking motivations, and the profit-seeking motivations will be aimed at, in the direction of making sure that people are safe, people have effective products, people have user-friendly products, user, people are in a position to enjoy their products. And that's how they make money rather than by having political pull in Washington. All right, we have a question from Dave who asks, I was just wondering if you were still writing the war racket, or is that one dead in the water? I remember you saying about a year or two ago that you were sorry for mentioning it because it ended up being a bigger undertaking than you had hoped or actually planned or expected, and you were thinking of chucking the idea. I hope to God you didn't chuck it, but I can certainly understand why you'd have to. By the way, if you did chuck it, do you plan to post what you've already written as standalone material on your website? I'm sure many of your readers, including me, would love to read it. Well, uh, Dave, I'm glad you brought this up because I hadn't even thought about publishing this on the Internet. Uh, what I have so far, let, let me back up for the benefit of those who are unfamiliar with all of this. And that is that I started writing a book called The War Racket, the lies, promises, uh, propaganda, and so on that had lured Americans into war after war after war. And the idea was to have a chapter on World War I, a chapter on World War II, a chapter on the Korean War, and so forth, to show that they just keep coming back with the same old lies, the same old promises that are never, never uh, made true. The lies turn out to be just the bald-faced variety, uh, and they were there and known before the war began in order to lure Americans into war for some ulterior motive on the part of the president and the people around him. In uh, World War II, uh, Roosevelt uh, got 
The Japanese to attack Pearl Harbor provoked them into doing so by butting his nose into business that wasn't his in Far East Asia. And Harry Truman rushed into the Korean War without stopping to think that this was none of America's business. Uh, the U.S. got into the Vietnam War. The U.S. got into World War One, And in all these cases, promises were made about the better world that would result as a result of this. Uh, and, of course, the better world never materialized. So whether it was making the world safe for democracy in World War One, or liberating Europe and Asia in World War Two, and, in fact, turning Europe and Asia over to the communists, or whatever it was, uh, none of the promises materialized and so on. So I began the task, and I did a great deal of research on World War One, and it was a fascinating story. I tell you, I knew the basics of World War One, but I didn't realize the depth of the of the deceptions that uh, were perpetrated on the American people. And uh, so it turned into a story much longer than one chapter, it turned into an entire part of a book, 125 pages, uh, really half of a of a manageable size book, and you know a third or a quarter of a, a bigger size book. And um, I really didn't know what to do. Plus, um, uh, this illness struck me. And it has reduced the number of hours that I can work in a day. And uh, so I'm, I'm not sure uh, exactly what to do as a result of that. But then along comes Dave to suggest that I publish the World War I material on the Internet. And I could do that. Uh, I might just send it first to a publisher that I know in New York, a, 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 the editor-in-chief at a huge publishing company that's published several of my books already, and just see what he has to say. But I'm sure that he isn't going to want to say, uh, let's publish this right away. This is really important stuff. So I might just publish it at libertyfree.com, where I'm publishing two books already for nine seventy five a piece that can be downloaded and read on your computer screen or printed out and read in your easy chair. And uh, do that. And then I have uh, I have to say that three quarters or more of the material for World War Ten, World War One, was coming from books that I have read and investigated from what I consider to be reliable sources. But I also have so much material on the Iraq War from uh, the Internet, almost entirely from the Internet, a little of it from books, but mostly from the Internet, from, again, what I consider to be reliable sources on the Internet, that I could then publish probably an equal size book of material on the Iraq War, all the different lies and deceptions, all the different propaganda, all the different promises that were made, and so on. And uh, we see about that. So there, there's a possibility here. There'd be a lot of work to assemble that Iraq material because... Uh, just having it doesn't uh, put it in the book form. Uh, there's a lot of organizing to do and a lot of shaping and so forth. But it's something to think about, and I appreciate Dave's suggestion because I think that's pointing me in the right direction. All right, let's go to the phones and talk to Eugene in Akron, Ohio. Good evening, Eugene. Good evening. How are you doing? I'm just fine. Okay, a few things. The first thing about uh, cutting brush, uh, this summer when the fires were raging, there was a guy in my office who said that for years in that area, the government said you could not cut trees if they were larger than two inches in diameter. Oh, you yes. You to say the trees kick. So suddenly we had these fires, and, uh, hey, these trees burn. What do you know? We started encouraging people to cut their trees near their home. Yeah, okay. that's very, very typical of the contradictory nature of these the different laws and these different campaigns. Okay, next, uh, circumstantial ethics. Uh, I was raised Catholic, and George Carlin talked about in his comedy routine that there would be something that would be a sin, like, say, eating meat on Friday. Mm -hmm. And then they would put it in the weird circumstances. You know, for example, he gave, okay, you're, you know, you're the Pacific, you cross over the international date line, you know, you eat meat or whatever. <laughs> so, it's and, not Friday anymore. Right, so does that make it a sin? Okay. Uh, the Zimmerman telegram. I had always heard that that was a hoax by the British, so I finally looked it up on the Internet and got a copy of it. And I really hope you cop uh, print a copy of it on your book. Oh, yes. They did not want to go to war with the United States. And what they said, uh, the state, the equivalent of their secretary of, of their state, uh, the telecom to their U.S. ambassador, or ambassador to the U.S., said, look, we're going to go back to unrestricted warfare. We hope the U.S. does not, you know, enter the war, but if they do, then go to Mexico offering them if they want to join us in the war. But their hope was to avoid a war with, uh, with the United States. Very definitely. And, yes, I am uh, printing a copy of it in the book. Uh, for those who don't know, we're talking about World War I. Uh, the United States stayed out of the war from 1914 to 1917, and, the British blockaded the North Sea and kept foodstuffs, even, as well as munitions, from reaching Germany. Germany did not have the naval capacity that the British did and had a very difficult time. They couldn't break the blockade, but they did have uh, an advance in submarines. They were highly advanced in submarines, and they used those submarines to uh, torpedo uh, ships that were carrying munitions and so on to uh, Britain from the United States and from other places. And they did everything they could to avoid trying to torpedo passenger ships and things of that sort. Uh, they occasionally slipped up, but it was obvious that their heart was in the right place. But uh, what happened then was at the beginning of 1917, the, the Germans decided to do what, as you said, unrestricted warfare, which meant that they would just go for broke and they would shoot at everything that came along. 
And they said, this is bound to cause a problem with the United States, and we're going to still try to keep the United States out of the war. But if we can't keep the United States out of the war, then we want you to go to the Mexican government and promise them that if they will join us on our side, then we will give them, uh, we will see that they get back to southwestern states and uh, will be returned to Mexico, states like Texas, uh, New Mexico, and Arizona. And um, they did not say we're going to war with the United States. They did not say that we want to go to war with the United States. Right. But uh, Wilson made it seem as though that's what they were saying. Right. And so whether or not it was a hoax, it doesn't really uh, concern us. Exactly. Because, because it was not a declaration of war in any sense whatsoever. Or a threat against the United States. And you mentioned not shooting uh, passenger ships. Mm -hmm. they, they bring up the Lusitania, but that's not saying awfully fast. For a ship with no uh, ammunition on it. Oh yeah, there's no question that it was carrying munitions because of the all the things that happened when it went down. And um, uh, the British, the Germans yeah. ran ad, the Germans ran ads in the New York papers yeah. the day the day of the sailing and a few days before saying, "Don't sail on this ship. It's in jeopardy. Uh, it, it is vulnerable to being torpedoed. You know, so forth and so on." Trying to keep Americans off the ship. It was not an American ship. It was a British uh, passenger ship carrying munitions. Yeah, I think it was even a reserve military ship. Yes. Yes, I think you're right about that. Um, yeah, thank you for bringing those things up. Uh, uh, all three of them on three different subjects were uh, valuable. Anything else you want to add? I do want to say I think we should admit that liberty is not for everyone, not in the sense that they should be restricted, but for what they want. Liberty will not be the answer. Because a lot of people want to enslave and exterminate people. They want to control other people's lives, brute force. I, I can talk a lot longer, but you just gave us a great talk on the first three ones, but I just want to make the last point that for many people, liberty is not the answer for what they want. Right, but that's a marketing question. Okay. And Eugene finished by saying that liberty is not for everyone. And this is, of course, a marketing problem. It is not a problem in trying to decide what kind of society would be the most fruitful, the fairest, uh, the most effective, and so on. Uh, what it means is that there are, as any salesman knows, various degrees of a prospect. A prospect may be just waiting for you to come along to say the magic words, and he will fall in your arms and say, oh, boy, now it all makes sense. Or he may be just absolutely full of resistance, and he may be anywhere in between. And if he's absolutely full of resistance and he is just determined that he wants to dictate to other people how they should live and this, that, and the other thing, then recognize that, that there are better prospects around. And you only have so much time. You only have so much energy. There's only so much you can do. Use that. Use those resources with people that are real prospects, people who are closer to the first end of the scale rather than the last end of the scale. And uh, this is an important thing, as I say, that any successful salesman has learned long since uh, in his career. And I think it's important for us as salesmen of liberty to realize this, too. I got a question from Alex out in cyberspace, and I'm not sure what the motivation was here. And I say I got the following question. I actually got ten questions. He says, I asked the following questions, and they're all about Iraq before the war started. And I'm not sure whether he's challenging me, saying, yeah, you answer these questions, and you'll show that the Iraqi war was justified, or whether he just is uh, asking for information. Number one, did Saddam use chemicals designed for weapons of mass destruction against the Kurds? Uh, we'll probably never know for sure, although there are plenty of Kurds still alive who could testify to this, but there is a lot of dispute over the just cut and dried idea that Hussein used these chemicals against his own people. Why in the world would he use the chemicals against his own people? He was fighting a war against Iran, and the, it was all up at the Kurdish border there with Iran, and there was nothing to be achieved by gassing the Kurds. The way George Bush says over and over again, uh, he gassed his own people. Uh, what was to be uh, accomplished by that? Uh, is there is a lot of evidence to show that the particular kind of gas that was used was a gas that was used by the Iranians, because both sides used gas in that war. And we assume that the Iranians used it against the Iraqis, and the Iraqis used it against the Iranians. It's the only thing that does make sense. And in this case, the Kurds would be the Iraqis, because they were uh, the Iraqis that were there in that area of the country. So nobody knows at least in this country for sure, all we know is what George Bush keeps saying, and George Bush has long since been discredited. Number two, did Saddam have illegal missiles that could reach the outer fringes of European nations? Well, it turned out that those missiles that uh, could uh, would supposedly go far, far beyond the United Nations restrictions could only travel about 75 miles. So the answer there is no. Three, did Saddam retain, retain scientists on his payroll who could create the illegal chemicals in a matter of weeks that could be used in those missiles? Possibly so. I don't know, but none of it was done. Number four, did Saddam pay each family of a suicide bomber 25000 for killing Israelis? That's what I've been told. I don't know what the figure was, but I've been told that he gave rewards for suicide bombers that went in and killed Israelis. So uh, possibly the answer to that is yes. Five, did Saddam slaughter tens of thousands of his own people? I don't know. I only know what George Bush said. Number six, did Saddam cause the torture and or rape of people? I don't know that either. I only know what George Bush says. 
Number seven, did Saddam pay billions of oil for food money in bribes to principles of three of the four nations who voted action by the U.N. after the U.N. Security Council voted unanimously for Resolution 1441? I presume here that the, the, infer, the uh, implication is that Saddam used uh, oil for food money to bribe people in Germany, France, and Russia and get them to vote uh, to veto action by the U.N. so that uh, the U.N. would not go to war against Iraq. And I have no knowledge of that whatsoever. And it seems very unlikely. Number nine, was Iraq firing missiles at our surveillance aircraft in violation of the agreement he signed? Of course he was firing missiles at our surveillance aircraft. Those surveillance aircraft were dropping bombs on Iraq. And they were flying over Iraq regularly, dropping bombs. And, in fact, it's been said now that those bombing raids were practice runs for the war that was coming. And uh, any country would fire back at uh, aircraft that was violating its airspace. And lastly are the records that reveal that on page 300,000 to al Zakari who is some of them Laden's advisor and supporter. I have no idea. Uh, here's a question from Tom out in Chandler, Arizona. While the Libertarian Party is a party of principle, does that mean it can't play politics? For example, one of the barriers to third party success is the electoral college system. Only the votes of those in the plurality really count in most states. Why not turn that system back on the big two parties? The LP could pick one of the big two for special opposition, then focus all LP resources on the few close states, ones within a few percent of going to either party specifically work to dilute the support of the chosen party there. If the Republicans are chosen, the LP message would emphasize smaller government and lower taxes to draw votes away from the Republican Party. If the Democratic Party is chosen, the LP message could emphasize protection of civil liberties, separation of church and state, and so on. Yes, I'm suggesting the LP deliberately play the role of spoiler for the chosen party, or at least convince that party that that's what happened. Why would the LP want to do such a thing? After all, it's bound to draw criticism from party loyalists who feel their party was entitled to win, and the LP knocked them down. Well, for one thing, there's a small chance that the LP might do their job so well that they'd end up getting a few electoral votes. Well, we can dream. Then there's the old axiom that there's no such thing as bad publicity. Any exposure that shows the LP having any kind of power will benefit the LP with those who would like to vote libertarian but don't want to waste their vote. Perhaps deliberately choose to, impose, to oppose the incumbent since contributing to throwing out an incumbent politician appears more powerful. Further, the two major parties will be forced to rethink the power of third parties. If the LP is really successful after a few spoiled elections, the big parties might join in a bipartisan call for an end to the outmoded electoral college system, figuring they'd be safer with one voter, one vote. And finally, when pundits start spouting how evil the LP is for deliberately thwarting the will of the people, the controversy will create opportunities to expose the hypocrisy of those defending a system so well designed to lock out third parties that is commonly known as the two-party system. Frankly, I see no downside for the LP and no conflict with libertarian principles. Do you? Well, you've uh, given us a lot to think about there, Tom, and let's take this time with the news to think about it uh, before um, I give you my thoughts on this because there's something that's being overlooked here, and it's being overlooked with many such plans that are suggested by people as a way of finally getting the LP to have a breakthrough after all these years. Well, Tom, I understand your feeling about this, and I understand the feeling of many people who, who come up with ideas like this, uh, but we have to realize that that two-party system is there not just because the public doesn't vote libertarian often enough, uh, but because the two major parties have passed laws that make it very, very, very difficult for the libertarian party to break into the system. Not just the libertarian party, any third party, the Green Party, the Constitution Party, whatever. But it's the libertarian party that's there election after election. And uh, as I say, it makes it very difficult. The, there are several ways that they do this. First of all, they have ballot access laws that make it very easy for a uh, Republican or Democrat to file for uh, running for office in any particular race. And, uh, pardon me, very, very easy for a Republican or Democrat to, to file to run for office in any particular race, while it's very, very, very difficult for a Libertarian or other third-party candidate to do so. The filing fee may be several times as much for a third-party candidate. Uh, the number of signatures necessary to get on the ballot may be many times as much. All of this consumes resources, and it keeps those resources away from the things that make elections such as advertising and publicity and staging of events and so forth, so that the Libertarian Party is not in a position to make its positions known. The Libertarian Party can say, oh, we're for more smaller government than the Republicans are. We want to cut taxes further. We want to do this. We want to do that. But if nobody hears that, it doesn't make any difference. And uh, in my presidential race, for instance, we raised $2.5 million. We would have liked to put $2 million of that into advertising, but a quarter million of it alone went into just getting on the ballot in two states, Pennsylvania and Oklahoma. We wound up in 49 states altogether, but we consumed enormous resources in doing so, 
so that we had a very small advertising budget by the time we were done. We, we did spend somewhere around $600,000 on advertising, in addition to uh, the cost of producing the ads, which I thought were very, very good ads and would have attracted a lot of attention. There, they, even on Fox News one night showed our Social Security ad just as a news item. But um, we didn't have the opportunity to spread around our message. And if we had concentrated that all in one state, it still would have been a drop in the bucket. And there are, of course, many other things, such as the debate commission rules that uh, keep third parties out so that uh, we don't get to get our views uh, transmitted that way. And uh, there are all kinds of barriers that are put up, and I've discussed them on this show before, so I don't need to go over them over and over and over again. But the point is that we are going to require something much more than just a fancy uh, way of trying to spoil the Republicans or the Democrats. What we're going to have to come up with is some way of attracting so much money so powerful of money and resources that we can break through these barriers. And that hasn't happened yet, but it's possible that it will happen. It's possible that if we keep talking about these things in the best way we know how, we may attract the people who can do things that we can't do, people who have innovative ideas that we don't have. We're getting around these things, but so far I haven't seen any. All right. Uh, somebody sent me a Did You Know by Andy Rooney. Uh, this is Lauren, Lauren out in cyberspace. Uh, I don't know where she got it, but she passed it on. And Andy Rooney had a commentator in which, a commentary in which he said, Did you know as you walk up the steps of the building which houses the U.S. Supreme Court, you can see near the top of the building a row of the world's lawgivers, and each one is facing one in the middle, who is facing forward with a full frontal view. It is Moses, and he's holding the Ten Commandments. As you enter the Supreme Court courtroom, the two huge oak doors have the Ten Commandments engraved on each lower portion of each door. Did you know, as you sit inside the courtroom, you can see the wall right above where the Supreme Court judges sit, a display of the Ten Commandments? Did you know that there are Bible verses etched in stone all over the federal buildings and monuments in Washington, D.C.? Did you know James Madison, the fourth president, known as the father of our Constitution, made the following statement? We have staked the whole of our, all of our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. Patrick Henry, that patriot and founding father of our country, said, It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you know every session of Congress begins with a prayer by a paid preacher whose salary has been paid by the taxpayer since 1777? And it goes on from there with other things. The first Supreme Court Justice John Jay said, America should elect and prefer Christians as their rulers. How, then, have we gotten to the point that everything we have done for 220 years in this country is now suddenly wrong and unconstitutional? Let's put it around the world and let the world see and remember what this country was built on. And uh, whoever passed this on said, I was asked to send this on if I agreed or deleted if I didn't. Now it is your turn. It said that 86% of Americans believe in God. Therefore, it is very hard to understand why there is such a mess about having the Ten Commandments on display, or in God we trust on our money, and having God in the Pledge of Allegiance. If you agree, pass this on. And that's... Uh, from Oliver Schreiber, I guess, out in cyberspace. All right, so we have all of these statements on behalf of God, the Ten Commandments, Moses, um, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, and so forth. Uh, but what does it mean? What, what's the upshot of that? Is America a theocracy? Is America then a religious state, like Iran is a fundamentalist Islam state, like Pakistan is a fundamentalist Islam state, like uh, many of the countries in the Middle East, accepting Iraq is a fundamentalist Islam state? Is it... Uh, Somewhat like uh, India is a Hindu state. Is that what we are? We're a Christian nation? Not just a Christian nation, but, yes, a Christian nation founded on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Before we went to the break, what were we talking about? All the references to God and to a Christian nation and so on by our founding fathers and all the Ten Commandments that are engraved in the U.S. Supreme Court, and then they get upset because some judge in Alabama wants to put a monument out in the front yard of the courtyard and pay for it with his own money, and the monument is to the Ten Commandments, of course. Well... The question, as I posed before, was do, do you really want the United States to be a theocracy like uh, Iran is or India or any of these other countries where there is only one state religion? Uh, do you want to enshrine this in law? Do you want to see to it uh, that people can only worship one way, that laws are now based on the rules of that religion and that people who violate the rules of that religion will be forced by the government, government using its guns and its power and its prisons to enforce those laws? I don't think that's what you really want. Because if you do, you are setting this up for a real power grab. Maybe someday it won't be the Christians that will control the government. It'll be the Jews. Or maybe someday it'll be the Muslims that control the government. And we will be forced to live 
in a Muslim theocracy. Is that what you want? Of course not. And how do you think the Muslims feel about living in a Christian theocracy? Are we going to kick the Muslims out of the country or force them to leave the country in order to uh, keep themselves out of trouble with the government and lose all the benefits, the intelligence, the skills, the talents that Muslims have in this country and are able to do to help us have a greater division of labor and to be able to do things that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise or we would have to purchase from overseas? Is that what we want? Of course not. We want a country in which people are free to think and believe and do what they want. We don't want a country in which people are burned at the stake for being witches, which is what can happen once religion takes over the government. Religion can be a very, very important thing and a very, very important part of anybody's life, but not when it is forced upon that person, because that's not religion, that's coercion. And, of course, we as libertarians oppose that mightily, but it's also important that we realize that uh, conservatives and Christians ought to realize this as well, that it is not in their interest to try to, to impose their way upon others through law and to institutionalize their religion in law. And I believe that any use of government property for this is a violation of church and state, a violation of the ideals of church and state, which is that we have a government for so long as we have to tolerate it, and we have religion, and we have church, and the church is there to give us sustenance, to uh, give us guidance in our lives, to do all sorts of things, but not to run the government, not to decide what laws are the right laws. And if that's going to be the case, then we must keep religion completely out of government. And I would do away with the congressional chaplain. I would do away with the prayers before a session. God knows they haven't helped us any. Uh, do you think those prayers are, are responsible for a $3.5 trillion budget? If so, let's get rid of them. Uh, the idea that this is going to give our lawmakers a wise counsel and help them to, to see things more clearly because of those prayers, uh, that has been proven wrong over and over and over and over again. So let's keep religion out of the government. Let each lawmaker, as he chooses, practice his own religion. If George Bush wants to pray before he makes a decision, that's his choice. But he should not be trying to impose his way on others through faith-based programs that are sponsored and paid for by the government. And I also wish he would quit having these messages from God that tell him to attack, to attack Iraq and uh, probably next to Iran and Syria and other places. All right, a uh, question came in from Dave. It's not really a question. He sent me an article, and it's entitled, It's Time to Take Seriously a U.S.-Led Global Recession. And uh, this writer, who uh, is apparently Asian, Lao Nai Kyung, says, I think it's time that we should take a serious look at the possibility that the U.S. is going to take us down towards a worldwide recession in one or two years' time. It's well known that the U.S. is the world's biggest economy, taking up about 30% of global GDP. But it is now also the world's biggest debtor country. According to the most authoritative person on this subject, the U.S. Comptroller General David Walker, who audits the federal government's books, the tab for the long-term promises the U.S. government has made to creditors, retirees, veterans, and the poor amounts to $43 trillion, which is equivalent to $145,000 per U.S. citizen or $350,000 for every full-time worker. And this figure doesn't even take into account all the personal debts. No, this is just the U.S. government liabilities does not take into account all the personal debts, such as credit card bills and mortgages. With a low interest rate of 1% running for the past three years in a row, savings plummeted to just 1.8% last year, below 1% since January and at zero in the latest estimate from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. In 2000, household debt broke 18% of disposable income for the first time in 20 years. Credit card debt alone averages $7,200 per household. Now, let me interrupt here. The savings rate that they're talking about, a low interest rate of 1% uh, prevailing on savings accounts means that nobody really wants to put money in savings accounts or save. But savings are much more than that. The savings rate of 1.8% last year means that uh, Americans took 1.8% of their income and put it into savings. Not 5%, 10%, or 20%, but 1.8%. And we'll talk about the significance of that because there's a lot that must be put in perspective when you hear figures like this, and you're going to hear them often. But we were talking about the possibility that the U.S. might take the world into a full-scale global recession, and we were at the point of talking about the savings rate, which was just 1.8% last year, which means that Americans saved 1.8% of the money that they earned. Now, by save, that doesn't mean just put it in bank savings account. It means putting it in treasury bills or treasury bonds or in stocks or uh, just about anything. But 
saving it instead of spending it, saving it for the future. And much more traditionally, the savings rate has been between 5 and 10%, and here it is down to 1.8%. And in other countries, such as many Asian countries, the savings rate is 15 or 20%, uh, that people are putting money away for the future, and what they're doing is that they're accumulating capital, which can be used to make life better in the future. Uh, the more capital you accumulate, the more things that you can create in the future, and you can't create things in the future when you haven't put anything away, whether you put it away in stocks or bonds or uh, savings uh, accounts or whatever it may be. And uh, they also say here in this article that in the year 2000, household debt broke 18% of disposable income for the first time in 20 years, meaning that the amount that people were in debt amounted to 18% of the income that they can actually use uh, once they've paid their taxes, once they've paid to the, their uh, basic required bills and so forth. And credit card debt is at 7200 per household. Um, not to mention all of the liabilities of the federal government, which, according to the Comptroller General, comprise $43 trillion, or $350,000 for every full-time worker. Now, um, the article says the U.S. government indebtedness is financed by the U.S. running a trade deficit, roughly 6.5% of its GDP, and the gap is widened every day. It's spent, citizens are spending ever more on foreign goods, and with the U.S. dollar as the international currency, the U.S. government just prints money to finance the deficit. And with this money, central banks in the surplus countries purchase most of the U.S. Treasury bonds as currency reserve. Well, you can't have both ways. They're either printing the money to cover the deficit, or foreign governments are lending the money to cover the deficits. And it is really much more of the foreign governments uh, lending money to cover the deficits. But it isn't really even just foreign governments. It's foreign individuals, foreign corporations uh, that still have enough faith in the U.S. dollar and the U.S. government and the U.S. economy to buy U.S. stocks, to buy U.S. bonds, government or private, in order to uh, have uh, what they think is a good investment for the future. They think stocks in America are going to continue to go up. They think that uh, bonds will continue to be paid off and so on. And uh, uh, so a lot of this can get all mixed up, and it also can be taken out of uh, context. One of the great economic fallacies is taking a statistic out of context and pointing to it and drawing a horrendous conclusion from it, uh, some very great significant conclusion that something terrible is going to happen or something very good is going to happen. It doesn't matter which, but investment advisors do this all the time in order to get you to buy a particular type of investment. And, uh, and of course, people just writing about the economy do it too, partly because it makes a good story, partly because they don't know any better. Going on with this, by now Japan is the largest creditor of the U.S. government, and the Chinese mainland has been a fervent buyer for the last few years. I presume it means fervent buyer of U.S. securities. As for Hong Kong, most if not of all, if most if not all of our reserves are in U.S. dollar denominated assets. I guess this writer is from Hong Kong. He's saying that Hong Kong's reserves are in U.S. assets. The U.S. government in turn uses this foreign borrowed money to finance as much as 90% of the federal deficit, which stood at U.S. 412 billion last year. Well, I'm in Atlanta. I don't have access to my uh, statistical information that I have at home, but I can almost guarantee you that 90% of the federal deficit is not financed by foreigners. I think that it is financed largely by Americans, American individuals, corporations, and organizations that buy treasury bonds, treasury bills, and so on, and through money market funds, the same sort of thing, and even through bond funds. Uh, and there is a large uh, portion that is financed by foreigners, probably, in I would guess, in the neighborhood of 15 to 20% but I can't believe it's 90%, and I will try to remember to check on that when I get home and report on it next week. If I don't report on it, uh, just call in and ask me to, and at one of the breaks I'll check the information and have it for you before the show is over. The federal deficit is expected to be running at about $2 billion a day at the moment. In other words, about $700 billion a year. Well, it could get that large by the time 2006 is over. But simply, the Americans have been living way beyond their means for much too long, the article says. On top of this, the Bush administration is cutting tax at least three times while fighting an expensive war in Iraq, which has already cost the country $700 billion, and currently progressing at $5.5 billion per month. Now the U.S. economy is dependent on the Central Bank of Japan, China, and other nations to invest in U.S. treasuries and keep American interest rates down. The low rates keep American consumers snapping up imported goods. Well, there is this idea that the foreign governments are monoliths, that they own this huge part of American debt, and at any moment they might decide no longer to finance the American debt. And when they do, the house of cards is going to come down. But it isn't that way. In the first place, they don't finance the majority of the American debt. Secondly, they are not all governments that are doing this. These are individuals, organizations, corporations, and governments, as I said before. And third, they do not act in concert. Each one of them acts on its own initiative for its own self-interest. And that means that at some point, 
Some of them will drop out of holding that debt. At other times, others will drop out. But what happens when they decide not to continue holding U.S. securities? What will happen then? And we're talking about the horrifying economic statistics in the United States and how this could create uh, could trigger a worldwide recession. And this is, I see now from uh, an article that I've been reading you, is from the China Daily, the Hong Kong edition of October 6, 2005. Now, let's put all this in perspective. And the most important perspective in, and the most important context is that 20 years ago, people were saying roughly the same things. The figures were not the same, but people were pointing to horrifying statistics in the United States, a low savings rate, uh, debt being financed by foreigners, and they weren't going to put up with it much longer. And when they pulled the plug, uh, that's it for the United States and so forth. Uh, I could go back if, uh, if I still kept newsletters from those days as I used to. Then I had a room full of file cabinets just filled with newsletters uh, of other investment writers and all the things that they were saying at the time. And when we moved into a smaller house a few months ago, we had to chuck a great deal of stuff, and those were the first to go. But I wish I had just a couple of examples to give you of that, but I can assure you that people were saying that the U.S. could not go on this way for more than another six months or a year or whatever, that it was about to to uh, bring about an economic collapse. Now, I'm not saying that there can't be an economic collapse, that there can't be a terrible recession, that there can't even be a worldwide depression. It might start tomorrow morning. I'm just saying that all these horrifying statistics that I've given you cannot be taken as proof that it is going to happen. We might go on for another 10 years, another 20 years. Who knows? One thing in economics that's important to understand is that you can never predict timing. You might be able to predict the rough edges of a long-term trend. You might be able to say that eventually X is going to lead to Y, but you can't say that X is going to lead to Y in a month, six months, a year, ten years, or any other time frame. It simply is not possible. Why? Because X is not the only factor that's going to be brought to bear on Y. There are going to be all sorts of other influences that are going to determine the outcome, and they might delay considerably the arrival of Y. They might speed up the arrival of Y. Whatever it is you've planned, whatever timetable you've set, it's bound to be thrown awry by all these other factors that are going to be brought to bear on the situation. And uh, it is actually the, the mark of an amateur to believe that these few statistics tell us that something is about to happen. We have to look at this with regard to gold also. There are all kinds of reasons that gold ought to go up, and it probably will go up, and it probably will go up a big time but I don't know when that will be. It isn't necessarily this month, next month, next year, or the year after. And uh, it's very important in economics to realize that, and that's why it is important also to plan your investment portfolio around an uncertain world rather than around predictions, around the idea that this has to go up in the near future or that has to go up in the near future, but rather to have a balanced portfolio that will take care of you whatever may come. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight. I really enjoy doing these shows with you, and I'm so glad that you tune in. I'll see you next week. Don't forget.